Hello friends and shalom. This is Tom with Truth Ignited Ministry where I talk about things that they don't teach you in churches. And today I'm bringing a message that I have titled Checkmate or Stalemate. And these of course are terms that are used in the game of chess, which is probably one of the most famous games in, in the entire world. Like everybody's familiar with chess. And you know, while I'm not one to play this game a whole lot, I, I have played it before and you know, I've got a general understanding of the rules of the game. And I also understand that the game typically ends in one of two ways. You see, the objective of the game of chess is to capture your opponent's king piece. But in a well-played game, that never actually happens. Typically, now, now I know with like amateur players and things that, you know, that may actually happen, but what I'm talking about, you know, skilled chess players, we, we never actually get to a point where the king is actually captured because typically, you know, those players who know the game, the game ends with either a checkmate or a stalemate. Those, those two terms. And a checkmate is where you've sealed capture of the king piece. Your, your opponent is trapped with no way left to secure the safety of their king. A stalemate on... See, see like, you, you get to a point in the game with the checkmate where you make a move and you announce checkmate and the game is over. The king is never actually physically captured. You're just letting the person know, like, it's over. Like, you make one more move and, and I capture the king. So once that happens, the game is over. A stalemate, on the other hand, is where the game locks with no way left for either player to capture their opponent's kings. So what might happen is you get down to a point where each player only has their king left. You've captured all of the other pieces and the only the only pieces left on the board are the two king pieces. Well, because of the rules of the game and the rules that allow how where the king piece can move only one space at a time in either direction, there's no possible way to capture your opponent's king piece. Because if you make a move that puts you one space away from the king, they capture your king. So it's a stalemate, like it's a draw. There's there's no winner in that situation. And, and see, you know, we see this up with other games as well, like tic-tac-toe, for example, right? Y you know, where, you know, two people, they know the game, and then it's impossible for either player to win, it always ends in a draw or a stalemate, right? Because you, you put the X and then somebody puts the O and you put the X and, and people who are very skilled at that game, they know where to put the X's and O's and all of a sudden you're left with a board filled with X's and O's and no winner. So you got a draw, you've got a stalemate. And see, if you've been following my broadcast recently, you'll know that I've issued a challenge to Christians, really to anti-Torah, anti-Nomian type Christians. Anybody, and I know some people say, well, we're not anti and I'm going to get into that in a minute. Oh, we're not really anti-Torah. We're not anti-Nomians. I'm going to talk about that, right? But beliefs that say we do not have to follow the Torah as Christians. I've put out a challenge to any Christian that has any form of of that type of a belief. And my challenge has put $10,000 of my own money on the line. And listen, for those who may be concerned, let me just assure you, not one penny of this money is coming from donations to Truth Ignited Ministry. So if you donate, if you give to Truth Ignited through our Cash App or, or through the podcast subscription or, or some other way, buying t-shirts from our, our site that you can buy t-shirts from our Truth Ignited site on T Public. It's a t-shirts, dropships, t-shirts store of sorts. And we've got some cool products on there, right? And, and you should check that stuff out, right? But but listen, I can assure you that no money that comes into Truth Ignited from those kinds of 
donations or, or sales from t-shirts or any of that kind of thing goes into this money that I have secured for this challenge. This is right out of my own pocket. It's, and I've got, listen, I've got it sitting in the bank where I can earn interest on it. And listen, I got a feeling I'm going to earn a lot of interest on it because, you know, for many years to come, because nobody's going to win this challenge, right? And I'm going to explain why nobody's going to win this challenge. Because I feel that the contest I've issued can only end in one of two ways. You see, I've issued the challenge to prove wrong the Torah positive theology or the, the belief that we in the new covenant are to live by the Torah. And the way I see it, and again, the challenge is to prove me wrong. So, but the way I see it, there, there, there's no way anyone can prove the pronomian or Torah positive belief, whatever you want to call it, however you want to label it, you can't prove that it's wrong. Now, now, now when the Bible opens with those who neglected the commandment of God, losing access to the tree of life, and concludes with those who followed the commandments of God, gaining access once again to the tree of life. Genesis chapter 3, Revelation 22, it's all right there. Not when Satan is the lawless one who first presents himself as the serpent in the midst of the garden, asking, did God really say? Telling people that they won't surely die. That's not a salvation issue. Nobody goes to hell for that sin, that violation of the Torah and leading people to believe that there's a reward for breaking the commandment. You know, you will be like God, the serpent said. Christians would say, you don't want to avoid the cross. You don't want to fall from grace, do you? Now, now, not when Yeshua, I'm telling you why they can't prove me wrong. Not when Yeshua is called the righteous one. And we see him all through the gospel record, living by the Torah and telling us his followers to do the same. Not when 1 John 2, 4 says that those who claim to be in him, those who claim to be born again, those who claim to be saved, but don't keep the commandments of God, the Torah, are liars and the truth is not in them. Not when 1 John 2, 6 says that, that anyone who is truly in him must walk just as he walked. That's not a suggestion. Must is a commanding word. You must walk as he walked. Not you should walk as he walked. It would be nice if you walked as he, he walked. You must walk as he walked. You don't keep the commandments, you're a liar. You must walk as he walked. And see, I'm not doing messages like this to try to get anyone to give up on my challenge, right? That's not my objective. I'm not trying to trying to beat you down and say it's impossible. Don't even try. Look, if you sincerely believe the message you preach, if you're one of these anti-Torah, anti-Nomian, anti-Torah-ism some people may prefer, if, if you're one of those kinds of people and you are 100% certain that the anti-Torah position or, or anti-Torah-ism or, or whatever term that you prefer, it's all the same, it, you know, it's all the same thing. But, but there are people out there spinning crafty language and say that they're not anti-Torah. Listen, check this out, right? That popular antinomian hyper-grace preacher, that heretic Joseph Prince, he got a real big church, real big following. It's all grace, grace, grace. Everything is, and he doesn't have a proper understanding of grace, right? And listen, he says that it's, listen, he says that he's not against God's law for the purpose God 
gave the law, but then he says that God did not give the law for us to keep it. Now, how absurd of a statement is that? Well, I, I'm not against God's law, but what well, you've got to understand, God didn't give us the law for us to obey his law. Oh, wh what? What? That's like telling your child, go clean your room, but I don't really mean go clean your room. I'm not telling you to clean your room so that you'll go clean your room. I mean, come on. Like, this is this is what this stuff is. Like, these people, I, I just can't. Listen, man, I'm serious. And that's literally what the guy says. It's in his book, Destined to Rain. One of his most popular books, Destined to Rain. He says it right in there. I had an exchange with Rob Solberg. And you know, if you follow Torah Positive Ministry, that's the guy that other Torah teachers have spent a lot of time refuting. Because he's the author of a book that he titled, Torahism, Are Christians Required to Keep the Law of Moses? That, that's his book, right? And he said to me, he said, he said that he's not anti-Torah. He believes the Torah is not irrelevant to Christians. He just believes that Christians are not under the old covenant laws. Wait a minute. Dude, you're contradicting yourself. Oh, well, well, we, we you know, the, the law is not irrelevant. We just don't have to follow it. What? He, he would probably say, since it's his buzzword, that he's anti-Torahism because he, he wants us to believe that he's not anti-Torah. So he's, I guess he figures, I'll be anti-Torahism, and that's somehow different than being anti-Torah. See, these people are using crafty language to make you think that they're not opposed to God's law. Just that God's law is not for you to follow. You know, we don't, we're not against it. We just don't believe we have to follow it. You know, th this guy Solberg told me that if he wanted to be taken, if, if I wanted to be taken serious, then it's critical that I understand and correctly state his position. He's trying to tell me, no, I'm not anti-Torah, and you've got to correctly understand that I'm not anti-Torah if you want me to take you serious, right? Well, l listen, listen, if that's the case, then he should quit calling us all the Torah positive teachers that are, you know, coming against him and he's coming against, he should quit calling us Hebrew roots teachers, right? Because he likes to do that. This guy loves it. He's like, he's like, well, I've been dealing with this one Hebrew roots teacher and the guy he's talking about is not Hebrew roots. Has dismisses Hebrews, says, says that's a cult. I'm not a part of that. I don't want anything. I'm not, I'm not in that. But this guy Solberg keeps misrepresenting him as a Hebrew Roots teacher, right? Listen, we're not all a part of that Hebrew Roots cult that believes the earth is flat, claims non-canonical books are scripture, uses weird sacred name cult names for Yah, the Father, and Yeshua, the Son, the Messiah. You know, they, they like to say Yahuwah, whatever the heck that is, right? Yahuwah, right? And it's just people just pull that out of a hat somewhere, right? I actually know where it came from. It came from a cult leader. I've studied how the origin of that name. It comes from a cult leader out of his book, right? And Yahawashi is one that they, Yahusha. That's like the Yahuwah version of Yeshua, right? Yabba dabba do ya, right? Right, whatever. Get, you know, the, the, the Hebrew roots cult gets caught up in bizarre approaches to scripture like Bible codes, Hebrew word picture codes, Kabbalist levels of interpreting the scripture, which is wrong on so many levels. They promote things like polygamy. No, no, that's for real. You look at the Hebrew roots cults and a lot of them are po promoting polygamy, okay? See, those things, those are the things connected with Hebrew roots cults. Those are the things that make it a cult. The parts of the Bible that they endorse that are not accepted by the mainstream churches, you know, keeping the Sabbath, celebrating the feast days, following the food laws, that kind of stuff, right? 
in the cults, the Hebrew roots cults, and, and other cults do this with things just like that and other things. Those are the hook. Have you ever gone fishing? Have you ever gone fishing? Use a hook, right? And you put some bait on the hook to catch the fish, right? And so the truth that they preach that's not preached in the churches is the hook, okay? And look, they, they use those things. They're the things that are used to say, look, this is in the Bible. You, you remember the Sabbath is, is in the Bible. The food laws are in the Bible. The, the feast days are in the Bible. Why doesn't your church ever follow these things? They're in the Bible. The cults use the, the, the cults use those practices. They're used to hook you into the cult. That's what they're that's what they're there for. That's the, the purpose of the cults using these biblical truths. But that doesn't invalidate them as biblical truths. They're still biblical truths that we're supposed to follow. But here's the deal, man. There's no way to prove wrong the pronomian or Torah positive position. If you set out to do it, and what you would have to do is provide an argument against this position that cannot be refuted or contested with a pronomian counter argument. That's what these guys aren't understanding. Like, like that Rob Sober guy, he said, he said, just go to my website and you'll find all the proof. I, no, I will not find all the proof you need. I need because your website is filled with articles of opinion, articles of interpretation of passages that there are pronomian counter arguments to. You have not presented an argument that cannot be refuted, an argument of a passage that does not have already a pronomian version of that passage. So you haven't proven anything. If you set out to do it, you're either going to end in one of two ways. You'll either find yourself in checkmate, finding that there are, in contrast, pronomian arguments that you cannot refute, that you cannot provide an anti-Torah or anti-Torah anti-Torahism or antinomian counter-argument against. You know, take for example the flat earth theory, right? We, we, I mentioned that a minute ago. That, that's popular in the Hebrew roots cults, right? And we can go back and forth about that with its proponents. And we'll spin a lot of our wheels trying to trying to argue with those people and, and they can be really difficult to deal with. But, but we can shut the whole thing down simply by going into space and observing the earth. That, now that's easier said than done, as humanity has not achieved yet commercial space flight, let alone affordable commercial space flight. Because I heard about one guy, one of those rich people that created some kind of a space flight that he was coming up with, and I think it was like $250,000 to buy a ticket for it, right? So even if there's space flight, commercial space flight, it's not affordable to the masses. And listen, that's one possibility. If someone sets out to prove me and other Torah positive teachers wrong, that they will back their selves, their own selves, into a corner and checkmate themselves by trying to refute our position. Or the other, the other thing that would happen, most likely would happen, is they'll find themselves in a stalemate situation. You know, and that's really the more likely scenario. Take, for example, the evolutionism versus creationism debate. You know, that's a whole big thing, right? And there's a lot of Christian creationist groups out there like Answers in Genesis, the Institute for Creation Research, David Reeves Ministries. And, and you know, David comes David Reeves comes from a Torah positive background, a Torah positive family. Okay, and, and there's others who do a lot of work to promote biblical creationism over atheist evolutionism. But at the end of the day, neither group has proven their side over the other. All either side has done is presented a host of well-structured arguments for their respective position on that debate. And, and listen, it, 
From there, we're left with a choice. Either embrace the atheist evolution view and take our chances that, that there is no God, when, and then when we die, that's all there is, or, or, or whatever, right? Or, or, even if you're not even convinced of any kind of religion, you could say, you know what? Those creationists make a lot of good points. And if they're right, then I would be better off following God than rejecting even the very notion of God, right? But listen, and until, until we can come up with a definitive, solid proof that, that one of those things is undeniably, and, and if that happened, the other would become non-existent because there would be irrefutable proof, right? So, so like, what, what would be a good proof, right? A, a good proof would be God coming down from heaven and saying, hey, here I am. You, you atheists were wrong, right? That would be irrefutable proof. Nobody, like, if that happened, there wouldn't be an atheist left on the earth. There wouldn't be an evolutionist left on the earth, right? And, and that's where the stalemate between Torah positive theology and anti-Torah or anti-Torahism or, or antinomianism or whatever, if anyone prefers any of those terms, that's where it leaves us at a stalemate. You can follow the various positions against following the Torah, whether it's this anti-Torahism, people saying that they're not against the Torah, just, just against following the Torah. I, I mean, how silly. We're not against the Torah. We're just against following the Torah. <laughs> really? You listen to full-blown antinomianism and Marcionism and Calvinism and all of the other heretical isms that radically oppose following the Torah. Or you can say, you know what? The anti-Torah folks have put a lot of thought into their arguments, sure. But the Torah positive folks make a really solid case in their own right. And if the anti-Torah groups are right, have the Torah-positive folks lost anything? There's not a penalty for obedience. God's not going to say to people, Oh, wait, you mean you kept the Sabbath? You mean you followed the food laws? You celebrated those Jewish, I mean, appointed feast days? You didn't celebrate Christmas and Easter and Halloween? Well, that's just... No, 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 no. You shouldn't have done any of those things. Depart from me, worker of law-keeping. Right? That's not what the Bible says, right? But, but look, what if these Torah people are right? What if we're right? If, if we're right, that does, what does that mean for the anti-Torah people? Those who say that we do not, as Christians, have to follow the Torah. And, and that really is the question that hangs over the head of every single person who says that we don't have to live by the Torah. What if you're wrong? You may not realize it, but if that's you, if you're listening to this and you're of that antinomian, anti-Torah, anti-Torahism, whatever you want to call it, whatever, whatever's in your mind to call it, right? Uh, that question is hanging over your head right now. It's haunting you. And if you don't heed it, it may be the greatest regret of your life when you stand before God at the judgment. A lot of people might be regretting that. My challenge, my $10,000 reward, all that aside, there's no argument that has ever been made by the people who say we don't have to follow the Torah that has not been countered by an equal or even stronger counter argument. Read Galatians. They like they, they love that. Read Galatians. You need to have you ever read Galatians? One hotshot preacher one time told me he said you need to make Galatians your favorite book in the whole Bible. Listen, I got a whole bunch. Here's a few of them right here. Whole bunch of pronomian messianic leading messianic scholars have written commentaries and books about Galatians that explain Galatians from a pronomian perspective. 
Mark 7, Acts 10, Romans 14, 1 Timothy 4, Colossians 2. You know, all those passages about the food laws are done away with, right? And listen, I and others have written solid, pronomian counter-arguments to the popular antinomian Christian understanding of those passages. Jesus is your Sabbath, they like to say, right? The, the Bible never says that, but Yeshua is the bread of life. Does that mean that you don't eat food? Yeshua is the light of the world. Does that mean you can't turn on lights in your house or, or go outside in the daytime when the sun is out? Yeshua is the door. Does that mean you remove the doors from your house and hope that Yeshua keeps out all of the bugs and the burglars? See, you can disagree with the promonomian position. You can disagree with our counter arguments, but you can't, you can not prove that we are wrong. You cannot prove that your anti-Torah, anti-Torahism, or, or whatever you want to call it, is right. You might convince some people of your position, but we might convince others of ours. But neither can be proven to be right. So we're left with common sense. We're left with what is the most logical conclusion, erring on the side of caution. And that will always be the path of obedience, the path of Torah obedience. Because you know what? The anti-Torah, anti-Torahism, whatever, positions always pit the Bible against the Bible. They're always saying things like, that was for this time. This is for this time. They're always saying things like, that was for Israel. This is for Christianity. But the Torah positive position always makes the Bible one complete and agreeing word of God. The same yesterday, today, and forever. A book that changes not. The antinomian belief says parts of the Bible are for some people and other parts are for other people. And it creates all sorts of confusion. And God is not the author of confusion. The Torah positive view makes the whole Bible one complete book for all people at all times of history. Exactly like it says. Exodus 12.49, Numbers 15.16, Ecclesiastes 12.13. And that is where we, the Torah positive folks, will always have the majority view of anti-Torah forms of Christianity in checkmate. That's where we've got them. Because you can't prove it wrong, but common sense says, obey this book, obey the Bible, obey the Torah of our God. That is the only most logical conclusion that you can ever come to. And friends, I gotta bring this broadcast to an end now. We've put the Christians in checkmate. We've issued the challenge, $10,000. Can they do it? Time will tell. But for now, I gotta say, there's much to be gained by a return to the discarded values of the past. And I'll see you in the next message. Shalom. Hey there, I'm so glad you tuned in today. Now, if you enjoy the teachings of Truth Ignited and you want to financially support the ministry, we want to offer you a few ways to do that. First, we've got our cash app. Scan the QR code or use dollar sign Truth Ignited. Now, this is a preferred method because we don't incur any fees for this service. But we understand that not everybody uses the Cash App, so you can also go to our Spotify for Podcasters page right here, and you can sign up to become a $5 or $10 monthly partner. You can also visit truthignited.com and give your financial support there and find a lot more great messages just like the one you listen to. Also, be sure to check out our T Public store where you can find a lot of really cool merchandise, t-shirts and other items that you can use to show off your faith. Be sure to follow Truth Ignited on Facebook, Twitter or X, YouTube, Instagram, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And remember to share these messages on all of your social media pages. I'll see you next time. Blessings 
and shalom.